just like me, I forget the words to songs all the time. So I would like to encourage the praise team, just make them up. That's what I do. It's totally okay. And then as a choir director taught me one time, if you don't know the words at all, just mouth watermelon, and it's going to look like you know the words. So anyhow, you may be seated. I was recently reminded of a story uh, that I thought was uh, rather funny. It was a couple that was, they had been married 65 years. That's a pretty amazing accomplishment, don't you think? 65 years. Her name was Edith, and his name was William. And William went to the doctor to get checked out and make sure everything was okay. And, and he was there because he was starting to forget things. And if you had been married 65 years, just the course of life, you would forget some things. So he was there, and, and the doctor had he and Edith together. And he said, well, William, I think what you should do is you should start to write things down. Because if you write them down, it will help you to remember why you're doing what you're doing and what you went into a room for and things of that nature. So they went home, and they were sitting in their living room, and they were listening to the news, and they were reading the newspapers and just chatting a little bit. And William said, I think I'm going to go into the kitchen, and I'm going to make a snack. I'm going to peel some oranges. I'll be right back. And he got up to walk out, and Edith said, well, William, you should write that down. And he said, I don't need to write that down. I'm just going to the kitchen. I'm going to peel some oranges, and I'll be right back. So he went into the kitchen. About 35, 40 minutes go by, and he walks back into the living room. And he hands Edith a plate. And he says, here are your eggs and bacon. And she said, I knew you would forget the toast. You see, it's important to realize that in life, we have to adapt to our situations. Amen? So if you're anything like that, I have had that stage of life. I forget half of what I walk into a room for. And I'm at the stage where I spend a lot of time talking to myself, trying to walk myself through what I needed to do. So, but thank God we have technology where I can do little memo notes to myself all the time and then catch up on them later to see what I forgot to do that I was supposed to do. So that helps. So I appreciate that. Uh, my title today, my sermon, I think is something that... Uh, impacted me uniquely as I was studying this, and I went back and looked at notes uh, from when I first started in ministry, and I don't believe I've ever preached on this subject before, and I don't think I've heard anyone preach on it, but I'm sure they have, because there's nothing new under the sun. There's nothing we're going to glean out of the Bible that someone hasn't preached already, amen? So, but this is something new for Brother Rory, and as it impacted me the last several days as I was preparing this, I hope to share it in the same light in which it was given. But my title would be, and I want you to, to take a few moments before we get started, and, and I want you to greet one another and tell them you're glad here. And then you can also tell them, because this is my title, it ties into you introducing yourself. You can say, my name is Unicorn. My name is Unicorn. That's my title. So greet one or two people around you. Tell them you're glad they're in the house of God. Amen. My name is Unicorn. Amen, amen. Continue to pray as you, as you continue to greet one another. Continue to pray for Pastor and Sister Walker, that God will keep them safe in their travels uh, and as they may do go about their business. And if you don't like the weather that we have today, just remember spring is coming. Amen? In six to eight weeks, we're going to be past this, God willing, Lord willing. So, but there have been times, believe it or not, we have had snow on Easter. It is a possibility. So I'm not, you know prophesying that. I'm just saying it is a possibility. So, but we'll just take it and we'll go with it because the great thing about where we live, if you don't like the weather, just wait 15 minutes. It's going to change. Amen? So, my name is Unicorn. My name is Unicorn. Humans can't give you a spiritual strength. We can't do it for one another. We can encourage each other. We can build each other up. We can try to, to amplify the goodness in each other, but we cannot give spiritual strength strength. Only God can do that. Students of the Old Testament are well aware that it contains passages which many in the world find fantastic. From Noah's Ark to Jonah and the well, many stories and verses found in this sacred tomb fly in the face of modern scientific discovery. Some of the faithful, they maintain a literal belief while others have come to view the text as largely symbolic. But all can agree that the ancient words have had an enormous impact on world history. 
Whether you're in the camp that believes the word to be the true infallible word of God, which I am one of those, or if you just say, well, there's some of it that's right, and there's some of it that's more, you know, artistically expressed, I want you to know wherever you fall in that debate, the word of God, the Bible, has had a massive, significant, life-altering impact on the world that we live in today. Some of the more unique verses in the Old Testament refer to unicorns. Of course, when shadowed by tales of escaping a lion's den, trumpeting down city walls, or splitting enormous bodies of water with a staff, it's easy to see how these passages could be overlooked. But here are some that are taken straight from the King James Version of the Bible as we talk about unicorns. Numbers 23, verse 22 says, God brought them out of Egypt. He had, as it were, the strength of a unicorn. Numbers 24, verse 8, God brought him forth out of Egypt. He had, as it were, the strength of a unicorn. He shall eat up the nations, his enemies, and shall break their bones and pierce them through with his arrows. Deuteronomy 33, verse 17 says, His glory is like the firstling of his bullock, and his horns are like the horns of the unicorns. With them he shall push the people together to the ends of the earth. And they are 10,000 of Ephraim, and they are thousands of Manasseh. Job's 39, verses 9 through 12 says, Will the unicorn be willing to serve thee, or abide by thy crib? Canst thou bind the unicorn with his band in the furrow? Or will he harrow the valleys after thee? Will thou trust him, because his strength is great? Or will thou leave thy labor to him? Wilt thou believe him that he will bring home thy seed and gather it into thy barn? Psalms 22 verse 21 says, Save me from the lion's mouth, for thou hast heard me from the horns of the unicorns. Psalms 29 verse 6, He maketh them also to skip like a calf, Lebanon and Syrian like a young unicorn. The key verse today that I want to focus on is Psalms 92 verse 10. But my horn shalt thou exalt like the horn of a unicorn. I shall be anointed with fresh oil. I shall be anointed with fresh oil. Isaiah 34 verse 7 says, And the unicorn shall come down with them, and the bullocks with the bulls. And their land shall be soaked with blood, and their dust made fat with fatness. Unicorns are a mythical beast. No more real than dragons, which incidentally are also mentioned in the Bible. Look in the book of Revelations. But what are we to make of this? With so many references to the creature, could the unicorn actually have existed? Most experts say no, but they also say that the original manuscript shouldn't lead us to believe they didn't. The source text for each of these references give us the Hebrew re-im, which in the Jewish encyclopedia describes as a wild untamable animal of great strength and agility with mighty horns. If this sounds less like a unicorn and more like a rhinoceros, that's because many scholars believe these verses likely refer to the African mammal or animal. And the reason for that is if you look at the text of where most of those writers were at that time, they spent a portion of their ministry in the area of Africa. So Brother Rory's not telling you you have to believe in unicorns. I don't want you to walk out of here thinking Brother Rory's telling you that. I'm not. But for the little girls that are in the house, they probably like to hear that unicorns are in the Bible. Other translations sometimes designate the ream as a type of antelope, while still other scholars believe it refers to a one-horned ox. Whatever side of the camp you fall on today, whether it's a one-horned rhinoceros or a one-horned ox, I'm okay with that because neither impacts salvation. So we don't have to split the church over our definition of what this could be. But we do need to understand that the word unicorn was referenced, and in both of these texts, they reference both types of animals. Amen? Okay, good. I'm glad we're still with me. One group of fundamental creationists even proposed the somewhat unlikely theory that these verses referred to a triceratops. I am not in that group. But there's still hope for anyone who really, really likes the idea of actual unicorns. My niece is probably enjoying this sermon today. Answers in Genesis, a nonprofit Christian fundamentalist ministry that rejects the concept of evolution and scientific evolution of the earth, acknowledges the possibility that the unicorn in question may, in fact, be some other beast, but they just aren't sure. 
Modern readers have trouble with the Bible's unicorns because we forget that a single horned feature is not uncommon on God's menu for animal design. Consider the rhinoceros or the norwal, which is also called the unicorn of the sea. They explained before asserting that the absence of a unicorn in the modern world should not cause us to doubt its past existence. After all, they say, the extinction of the, do the, extinction of the dodo bird doesn't mean it never existed. They also note that 18th century reports from southern Africa describe rock drawings and eyewitnesses' account of fierce, single-horned, equine-like animals of what we would call a unicorn. So there you have it. Sadly, most scholars agree that the unicorns in question probably weren't real unicorns, but another more familiar animal. After all, no scientific finding or archaeological discovery to date has substantiated the existence of such a creature. But an absence of evidence is not evidence of absence. I'll say that for you one more time. But an absence of evidence is not evidence of absence. So for many out there, the hope of the unicorn can still remain. So here is the horn of the unicorn. That irresistible power which resides in the people of God, doing the work of God, in faith in God that is with them. Thou hast exalted my horn like that of the wild ox. Thou hast poured over me fresh oil. For lo, thy enemies shall perish. All evildoers shall be scattered. They are doomed to destruction forever. David sang that in Psalms 92, verses 7 through 10. As a man in his own strength, this king was weak and ineffectual. He said, I am a worm and no man. He said on another occasion, but armed with the power of the Most High, he saw himself as a wild ox with a horn of salvation. He was invincible because he saw himself as a unicorn. I want to challenge you today. We just went through a time of fasting, a time of commitment like never before. I want to remind you that when you make a commitment to the things of God, your world will not be all rainbows and golden streets. It's not going to be all lollipops and just, you know, gumdrops everywhere you go. You're going to have a few challenges when you step out of the ordinary and you try to walk into the extraordinary. When you say, I want to do more for the kingdom of God, you're going to have a few things that come against you. Amen? Does anybody feel like you've just had sickness after sickness, or your job's a little bit stressful, or the family's a little bit in, uh, cantankerous with one another? Has anybody just had a few weeks of, man, I just can't seem to get out of my own way? There's just problem and mess wherever I go. Has anybody experienced that today? I want you to understand that's because you're striving to be more for Christ. You're wanting to be a unicorn. And when we try to be a unicorn, we are going to face opposition. As good King Hezekiah said, when faced with the crisis of King Sennacherib of Assyria, do not be afraid or dismayed before the king of Assyria, for there is one greater with us, there is one greater with us than with him. With him is an arm of flesh, but with us is the Lord our God to help us and to fight our battles. Second Chronicles 32, 7 through 8. What that really means is all I have to do is realize whose side I am on. I don't even have to fight the battle because he's going to take care of it. I don't have to worry about what comes against me because God has it all in control. All I have to do is stand up and say, I am going to be a unicorn of salvation. I'm going to be a unicorn of truth. I'm going to be a unicorn of purpose. And I'm going to let fresh oil fresh anointing sweep over my life if you need something different then you need fresh oil if you need something more I'm telling you you need fresh oil you need the anointing that flows from the top of your head where the unicorn stem comes out all the way down to the sole of your feet because when his anointing is on you it gets in you and it changes your perspective is this all right today Something like this was in the minds of the later prophets when they declared the word of the Lord. On that day, 
will I cause a horn to spring forth to the house of Israel. Ezekiel 29, 21. Arise and thresh, O daughter of Zion, for I will make your horn iron and your hoofs bronze. Micah 4, 13. You don't have to worry about God. Can you give me what I need? I want to give you a revelation. He'll not just give you what you need. He will change you for what he wants you to be. He'll give you a horn of iron. He will give you strength beyond measure. He will give you perfect beyond comprehension it all starts when you say i'm a unicorn and i'm gonna be what god's called me to be and the psalmist was in no doubt at all when he said i will make a horn to sprout for david i have prepared a lamp for my anointed his enemies will i clothe with shame but upon himself his crown will shed its luster Psalms 132, 16, 17. Psalms 89, verse 24 says, My faithfulness and my steadfast love shall be with him. This was David. And in my name, in my name, shall his horn be exalted. You don't have to worry about, is anybody going to be on my side? I don't care if it's just you and Jesus, it's enough. I don't care if it's just you and God, it's enough. I don't care if it's just you and the Lord, it's enough. Because if he be for you, who can be against you? If he's for you, the job can't be against you. If he's for you, the family can't stay against you. If he's for you, your spouse is going to have to get along at some point. Now understand, Brother Rory is not saying go home and be self-righteous and tell your spouse, woman, get it together. That's a really bad idea. Don't do it. One thing I've learned in 20 plus years of marriage is that that would be a no-no. So don't try it. But you need to understand, if God is for you, you will win. My faithfulness and my steadfast love shall be with him. God is faithful even when we're not. God is true even when we're not. God is perfect even when we're not. And thank God because I'm not perfect a lot. But his faithfulness is. In all of these rhapsodies, Israel as a nation or represented in David, her king, is pictured as a rampaging wild ox. Their horns elevated proudly in the air, waiting the moment to rush into the fray and to execute the work of the Lord. What is the moral of these scriptures? Is it could it be, is it possible, that the people of God are irresistible? The people of God are invincible when God is behind them. That applies equally to Christians today as it did in Israel. In other words, he's the same God he was when that was written back then, and it applies today just like it did then. And if he's no respecter of person, he can bless me the same way he blessed David. He can use me the same way he used David. I just need to stand on the promises of God. I want my horn to be a horn of salvation. I'm already looking different than everybody I deal with every day, so I might as well take some pride in the fact that God has called me. I might as well take some ownership in the fact that he has set me apart. I might as well accept the fact that I have been paid for with a price that I can never repay. And I am marked, I am redeemed, I am redeemed, I am redeemed. You need to stand up and you need to shout out, I'm redeemed, I have a horn of salvation, I'm a unicorn, I am different. I'm a unicorn. I'm set apart. I'm a unicorn. I'm unique. I'm a unicorn. And God is going to use me. Amen? When the time falls due for another advancing in the outworking of the divine plan of God, and the watchers are awake and ready to share in the work of that advance, nothing can stop them. Dare I tell you, that time is today. That time is now. This is the moment for the unicorns to stand up, to step out, and be who God has called you to be. 2 Corinthians chapter 6, verse 1 and 2 says, We then, as workers together with him, beseech you also that you receive not the grace of God in vain. In other words, don't accept this grace and just say, I've got it and I'm good. You better take a hold of it. You better assume it. You better possess it. And you better work the grace. You need to stir up that gift. You better walk in grace because his grace is irreplaceable. His grace is irrefutable. His grace is unquenchable. His grace 
grace cannot be replicated. His grace cannot be duplicated. His grace is authentic. His grace is true. His grace is forevermore because his grace is the seal of salvation. You need God's grace. For he saith, I have heard thee in time, in a time accepted. In the day of salvation have I secured thee. Behold, now, now is the accepted time. Behold, now is the day of salvation. You live in the necessity of now. You are to be a unicorn now. You are to be different now. You are to step up now. You are to stand out now because you're a unicorn for such a time as this. There are times when the wild ox is tame, waiting quietly in his stay for the impulse which commands him to sally forth. But there are times, too, when there is work to be done. There's a battle to be fought for the king of kings and the lord of lords. There's a harvest to be reaped for the great sower. These are those times. This is that place. In our turn, we need to place our horns in a position of exaltation. Psalm 68, verse 11 and 12, in the NLT says it this way. The Lord gives the word, and a great army brings the good news. Enemy kings and their armies flee, while the women of Israel divide the plunder. Now let me break that down to you in a little bit of a different way. What that really means is that God has already fought your fight. He's wanting someone to understand you are walking in victory that I've already given you. And not only am I giving you victory over your situation, I'm going to give you what you didn't earn. I'm going to give you what you haven't asked for. I'm going to give you what you should be possessing that you don't even know to ask for it. I'm going to give you the blessings of your enemies. You didn't even work for them, and you're just going to go ahead and plunder those. You're going to take them. You're going to get promotions you didn't ask for. You're going to get position you didn't want. Your family's going to come together in ways you can't imagine. But it's going to happen when you start to walk in victory. It's going to happen when you step out and you claim victory. You cannot be a unicorn if you're going to be timid. You can't be a unicorn if you want to blend in like everyone else. You can't be a unicorn if you want to hide the horn. It's going to stand out. You got to understand there's something about being marked by Christ. Brother Larson, if I could borrow you for a minute. Now I asked him ahead of time and he said he was okay with this. So please understand I'm not picking on him. He's good with it. Now, I will tell you, if you want to hashtag this, you can go ahead and hashtag I'm a unicorn and make sure you copy Brother Larson. We need to let your wife get her camera ready so she can get a good picture of this. So. Now, does Brother Larson look like a great unicorn? Now, we're going to stand here for a minute before I start preaching. We start walking because I get a little excited and I get ahead of myself. I want everybody to get the photos they want so they're good. Look at your wife. She's taking one of you. You need to make sure she gets a good one. <laughs> Sister Knapp is into this, man. She's leaning forward. She's like looking for a good angle. She's like, she doesn't want to miss that. Now, we got to understand something. You, if you are in this house and you have been baptized in Jesus' name, raise your hand. If you've been able to enjoy the infilling of the Holy Ghost with the evidence of speaking in tongues, raise your other hand. Do you realize you are already marked, folks? I want to give you an epiphany. You can never go back to what it was. It ain't going to happen. You can try to hang out with the same crew you're hanging out with. You can try to be who you used to be. You ain't that. You can say, but you don't understand, Brother Rory. That's who I run with. No, you don't understand. You have been set apart. But Brother Rory, you don't understand. This is what I like to do. No, you don't understand. You have been made different. You are now a new creature. God has given you new gifts. He's given you new talents. He's given you a new call. You need to step up and you need to step out. When Brother Larson goes to work every day, he goes to work as a unicorn because he's been set apart. When he goes and homes with his kids and he takes them to the park, he's the unicorn that takes his kids to a park. When he goes home to have dinner with his family, he's a unicorn having dinner with his family because he's made up in his mind, I am different for the cause of Christ. This life is not my own. I have been set apart. I have been bought. I have been redeemed, and I'm going to be the unicorn God has called me to be. I'll take that. You can be seated. you got to understand that when you're a unicorn, you have been called to be different. 
Somebody needs to look at their situation. And in their spirit, they need to say, no more. I've had enough. I'm going to be what God's called me to be. Can I just say, let Jesus make you a unicorn. Yes, you've got a mess, but God can make you a unicorn in the middle of your mess. Yes, your family's dysfunctional, but God can make you a unicorn and turn that dysfunction into function. Yes, you've got brokenness, but God can turn that brokenness into wholeness. Yes, you've got addiction, but God can break addiction and give you completeness in him. Be the unicorn you've been called to be. It's time that we get past mamby-pamby, limp-wristed, feel-good Christianity. Amen. It's time somebody gets something in their backbone that says, I don't care if I'm the only one in my house living for God. I'm going to seek ye first the kingdom. It's time somebody says, I don't care if I'm the only Jesus freak at work. I'm going to be a freak for Jesus at my job. It's time we if we truly say we are living in the end time, then we better start living in the end time. We need to step up, we need to step out, and we need to be different. We've got to quit coming to church looking for a reason to be mad and angry at somebody. Because our home isn't what it used to be. Our family's not what it should be. Let me tell you, if you really want to change, you have to change. If you feel like you're not feeling God like you used to feel him years ago, he's not the one that moved. Amen. If you're wondering, how do I get that fresh anointing? I'll give you a little bit of insight. The greatest way to get that fresh anointing is you need to come back the same way you did when you first received the Holy Ghost. You need to say, God, I want to give you everything that I am. All of my junk, all of my mess, all of my attitude, all of everything. I want to place it all to you. I want to decrease so you can increase. I can't be the unicorn he's called me to be if I'm trying to cover the horn. I need to remember it all comes back to that horn of salvation. Everything comes back to that horn of salvation. It's not about me. It's about my family that needs saved. It's not about me. It's about my friends that need saved. It's not about me. It's about my youth group that needs to be saved. It's something we have got to move past. I can just show up to Sunday school and I've done my part. We've got to reach the lost. We have got to go beyond the ordinary. As we stand and the musicians come back, Psalms 92 verse 10 says, But my horn shall thou exalt like the horn of a unicorn. I shall be anointed with fresh oil. Rejoice not against me, Micah 7, 8. O my enemy, when I fall, I shall arise. When I sit in darkness, you know you're not always going to be in light. You're going to have a few moments where things just aren't that great. Sometimes you sit in darkness. Sometimes you put yourself in darkness. Sometimes people leave you and you're in darkness. Sometimes you're just there. But when I sit in darkness, the Lord shall be a light unto me. Many a time have, the afflicted, have they afflicted me from my youth, yet they have not prevailed against me. Psalms 129 verse 2. What I'm trying to get you to understand is wherever you're at in life, there's a verse to give you strength. Wherever you're at in life, there's a word that can give you power. you got to get into the word. You need to consume it, not because you just want to memorize it, but because you want to live it. You want to own it. You want it to be a part of who you are. Everything you need is in his word, including his spirit. It's in his word. The glory of the latter house shall be greater than the former, saith the Lord of hosts. And in this place... Will I give peace, saith the Lord of hosts. Haggai 2, verse 9. So I'm saying all that to say this. You're saying, Brother Rory, that was awesome. I liked it. Or Brother Rory, that was stupid and it was corny. I don't care either way. The point is you're still here and you had to listen to me, so ha ha. <laughs> but what I want you to understand, whether you're on the mountaintop or you're in the valley, you're right where you need to be because you're in the house of God. You don't have to have all the answers, but you do need the house of God. You don't have to know which way you're going to go. Just come to the house of God because 
this house is going to be greater than the former house. You're right where you need to be. You're in the house of God. What I want you to do is to do what you did when you first really felt the touch of God. I want you just to raise your hands. I want you to close your eyes. And I want you to just start to praise him and thank him for what he's done in your life. God, I thank you for the blessings you've given me. I thank you for your presence and your power in my life. I thank you for the horn of salvation. God, I thank you for how you've kept me. I thank you for how you've healed me. I thank you for how you've blessed my wife, how you've blessed me. I thank you, God, for the goodness you've placed in our lives. I even thank you for the trial. I thank you for the struggle because in the struggle, I've seen your goodness. In the trial, I've seen your steadfastness. I thank you, God, for the triumph. I thank you, God, for the trial. I thank you, God, for the struggle and I thank you for the victory. God, my story is not yet told. You are not done making me. You are perfecting me in your word. You're perfecting me in your presence. I want you to break away the things that are not of you. I want you to shape me in your form. I want you to make me in your will. I've got to be a unicorn. I'm a unicorn. I'm a unicorn. Have your way with me like never before. Change me, God. Challenge me, Jesus. Shape me in you. As you close your eyes and they began to sing, I want you to ask yourself, when's the last time you gave everything you had to the things of God? Lord, have your way with us like never before. God, start to search us and to shape us like never before. God, I pray that you would make us sensitive to your presence. Give us a fresh oil. Give us a fresh anointing. God, let us be stirred and changed, not stirred and then leaving unchanged. God, it's not enough to come and to clap my hands and to raise my voice. It's not enough just to say, God, you're good. I want to be salt and light. I need to be salt and light. I've got to change my world. I've got to change my world. Have your way with everything that I am. I'm a unicorn, God. I'm called apart. I'm set apart. Set a fire down in my soul that I can't 